Good day and thank you for joining us. My name is Russell Hendrickson. I'm the CEO here at Practical Data Solutions and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Rethinking Today's Payer Contracts with Tomorrow's Metrics. I'm very pleased to have uh, Dan Marino, who's managing partner at Lumina Health Partners joining us. Thanks for joining us today, Dan. Oh, my pleasure. Happy to be here, Russell. So with that, let's jump right in. Um, just about a month ago, I saw an article that was published out in one of the healthcare journals that the MGMA did a survey and found that value-based care, you know, is uh, only accounted for about 7% of medical revenue among primary care specialties. And so, you know, what's interesting is, you know, today's topic talking about contract analysis I'll just pull up a quick visualization here, but you know, most organizations then doing fee-for-service type work are probably looking at things like, you know, E&M codes and procedure codes and surgical codes. And when they're thinking about doing contract analysis, it's mostly percentage of Medicare or percentage increases, you know, where you might be looking across your divisions at, you know, the current revenue you're expecting to receive and then this new proposed revenue, and you're probably used to sort of modeling contracts on procedures. And obviously the goal would be to looking for procedures or areas of your organization that might see a significant loss based on your suite of services that you're performing. And so that's kind of what people are used to doing today in the sort of fee for service world. But as you're gonna hear in today's topic, we're gonna to explore what's going on with value-based contracts and where we're headed. So with that, Dan, I wanna turn it over to you and let's dig yeah, right in. Thank you. Um, yeah, as you said, there's more and more momentum moving into the fee for value activities. There has been over the last number of years. I think a lot of folks feel like it's not moving as, as fast as we had thought a few years ago. Payers are still very much focused on the fee for service contracts, and rightly so. When you when you think about what the payers are interested in, they want to reduce costs, they want to manage utilization. It does put providers in a difficult situation. Providers are placed in a situation where they are really focused on how they need to manage their costs and accept lower rates. And in today's economic uh, challenges that we have, if wage inflation is up anywhere between seven to eight to nine percent. Um, it's very difficult for payer for providers to accept payers even at the same rates, let alone take a reduction. So moving into fee for value is definitely a strong alternative. If you go to the next slide, there's, there's a, a process that we, we consider as we think about what the right level of pricing strategies are. You don't automatically as a provider, as an integrated medical group, or even as a hospital system, you don't automatically jump into risk. You wanna be able to manage it appropriately. You wanna be able to sort of dip your toe in the water and get in slow, build your capabilities as, as you go along. So typically you're focusing on still your fee for service contract, but thinking then about how you need to structure um, your networks, track some of your outcomes, so you can move to the point where you're in a shared savings arrangement, you're accepting some level of a global rate, and eventually moving into capitation. So, there is this journey that we begin to see. But as we start to move into fee for value, and in particular, as the payers are putting a lot of pressure on providers, there are a number of key questions that CFOs are, are asking these days. And the biggest one that I hear all the time, Russell, is how quickly should we move into value-based care? How quickly should we move into risk without compromising our margins? And I have to tell you, you know, and you sort of alluded to this, understanding the analytic implica implications or the financial implications of a risk-based contract or even a value-based contract is something that is really new to a lot of health system leaders and in particular CFOs, and it does create a level of consternation. And a couple other key things that CFOs continue to ask is, how do we know if we're, we're negotiating the right contract? right? It's easy to look at an ROI from a fee-for-service contract. If your rates go up or your rates go down, you can tell, you know, if it's a good deal or not a good deal. For fee-for-value, it's a little bit different. So 
the analytics, the ability to measure that is really quite critical as we think about how we negotiate the right deal for the organization. Yeah, you know, Dan, we saw some organizations and the kind of things that I was running into, some of the organizations that dove sort of right into value-based contracting. In some cases, they got into contracts and then they were they were a little bit stymied because they weren't used to measuring the new sets of metrics. They weren't used to looking at their data. And there was this kind of, you know, flurry of, well, we, we've jumped in and we're going to make it work. But at the same time, without the right data, it, it really created some challenges. I think the the you know the early adopters have obviously uh, you know they've, they've started building analytical capability because you can't be successful without it. But today, you know, it's the same kind of things. We, we're we're seeing CFOs asking the questions like, well, what what should we be looking at? How do we make sense of where we are to where we're headed? Um, and that's you know really where the challenges come in. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So when you when you think about the elements that are important in a, a risk-based contract or, or some type of a performance-based contract really comes down to three things. One, how do you negotiate the right arrangement? And it's the right arrangement that is going to support your organization, take, take uh, into consideration or begin to leverage some of the great outcomes, but give you an opportunity to continue to build over time. This is clearly a journey. And as I mentioned, you don't just jump into risk. You want to be able to take some steps, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But number two is particularly important, and it really comes down to how you're managing the attributed population. It's not enough just to negotiate the deal. You need to perform around that deal. So you need to really begin to understand what's occurring with the population and then how you begin to influence that. And then number three, you have to measure your performance over time. You measure it so you can then provide some great insights to your physicians or your to your care managers or even to the leadership team, but you also then pull the outcomes together so you can negotiate the next contract. Okay. And so with that, let's dig into negotiating the risk arrangement and, and where do we start with all of that? Yeah, I, I, that that's good. I, and as I mentioned, that's kind of the, the starting point. So as I mentioned, we are beginning to see value-based care pick up a little steam. I think if anything, COVID highlighted the challenges and the limitations in the fee-for-service world. It also highlighted the ability to manage patients differently um, beyond the traditional care model. However, we're still, historically, we're still seeing, as you pointed out, um, when you look at a percentage of revenue, only about maybe seven to 10, less than 20% of any of those contracts are really value-based. Although, like I said, we are starting to see that increase. Now the government is helping a lot with this. They're helping a lot with putting forth the new ACO reach model. I think that's gonna be the next evolution of the ACO. We're also seeing that there's been um, a lot of emphasis placed on Medicare Advantage. So again, it's helping providers move into value-based care, but you have to do it in a way where you understand the risks. You can begin to plan, you can line your incentives. And if you can do that, then it positions you as an organization much stronger to continue to evolve over time. So when we think about getting into risk, as I mentioned, it's definitely a journey. Russell, you really focus on where you are right now from a fee-for-service world, you just want to start to build your organizational structure. And on this slide, I often try to break it down into little pieces that make it understandable, and you can then begin to kind of create your capability. So this phased approach, in my mind, uh, makes a lot of sense for organizations. Start small with some level of shared savings contract, but give yourself ability to measure your outcomes. Give yourself ability to report internally to your physicians on what you're doing well, where you need to go, and how you need to make those changes. As you do that, and as you're able to see some level of performance from your contract, and I usually set that benchmark somewhere around receiving at least 50% of your shared savings opportunity from the payer, then that positions you to move into phase two. And in phase two, you have to really focus on cost and cost of care. And it's not the expense cost, right? It's how we're managing our populations 
through the different risk cohorts, understanding what the risk stratification is. And what we're starting to see now is more and more payers are using the RAF score to designate um, risk and is the preferred risk methodology. It's included in the ACOs. Anthem recently said that they're incorporating all of their uh, risk methodology around the RAF score. So, <coughs> excuse me. Again, as we're starting to think about how to manage that population around HCCs and so forth, the RAF score becomes really important. So as we start to think about phase two and, and then moving into phase three, I typically like to say, look, as an organization, you should be receiving 80, 90% of your shared savings opportunity. You should be receiving 90% of your pay for performance opportunity. If you are, then that positions you really well to move into phase three and to start to negotiate risk. And again, by this time, you really need to understand all of the cost drivers. You need to understand how your risk components are being included. And I know we'll talk about HCCs as, as am I. I know this is an area which is, is near and dear to your heart and a great opportunity for physicians in particular to really focus on delivering the right care at the right time to patients, as well as then um, being able to then validate what the risk component is of the patients that they're seeing and then wrap some protocols around that. If you can get to that point and you're actually exceeding your shared savings opportunity, it provides a great opportunity for you to succeed and then have a different level of conversation with your payers. And I know when you kind of talk about the components that are in place there, Russell, you've done a lot of work um, and starting to outline different analytic capabilities really driving around each of the three phases. Yeah, you know what what we've seen. Obviously, um, you know I, I I would summarize it a little simpler. Uh, quality programs, right? Focusing on your quality programs and the incentives, and then really starting to get your arms around the RAF scores, which we're going to talk about coming up here. Um, whether you're contracting value based care or you're preparing to, um, it, it, it's right here, Dan, and and you know just reiterate what you said, right? That that's going to become key to understanding, you know, where you can. Um, you know, potentially contract and then increase your revenue. And if you don't have a good handle on that, you know, you're, you're almost flying blind, right? So. Yeah, absolutely right. Absolutely right. So often I get asked by a lot of the managed care folks or the, the CFOs, well, what do we start to look at when we build elements into a contract, when we really focus on, on fee for value? And, and a fee for value contract is much more complicated than, than fee for service. Well, these elements are really important. This is what drives the success of a contract. The number of attributed lives that you're managing around, the risk methodology, cost of care, domestic utilization. This is a real big one. And I know, Russell, we're going to talk about this in a second. But not only is this important for you to begin to understand how, you, how as an organization, we're managing our patients, there's a lot of cost and revenue implications around that domestic use, right? It really comes down to the leakage and, and so forth. But at the end of the day, you need to have good data. You need to have the data internally to be able to measure quality. You need to have the internal financial and cost data, and you need to have the claims data to really begin to understand what's occurring with the population, where they're going, what are the cost drivers, and obviously the risk attribution as well. Maybe we could spend a couple of minutes, Russell, going through some of the, the data activity. And I know you've done quite a bit of work around the modeling. Yeah, so I mean, a, a fairly simple slide here, but just kind of reiterating what you said, right? You need to be able to understand your costs of care. You need to understand your utilization, um, you know, very clearly, sort of core place to start. Um, we're gonna talk about RAF scores, but then understanding the attribution of your population. Um, you know, and getting a good handle. So, you know, this is a, a fairly simple slide to say, if you don't have analytics, if you don't have a sort of an enterprise data warehouse approach, or at least a strategic approach to reporting, maybe you don't have everything centralized, but if you can't get your hands on the right data 
and be able to start to relate. And this is where the challenges with analytics comes in. It's not enough just to look at, say, utilization. It's not enough to just look at, say, the, the RAF scores coming back from a particular payer. If you can't start to blend and correlate the data and arm your leadership and the managers with the appropriate tools, you're not gonna be well positioned. So you have to be thinking forward with analytics just as you're thinking about contracting and, and taking on risk. And that's kind of what we're trying to illustrate here. And we're gonna break this down just a little bit further um, by talking about you know, managing the population and how do we start to segment out our population and our, our physician panels to understand where is the high risk patients? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And I kind of think about it this way. If you can't measure it, how can you manage it? And when you, in, in particularly when you think about value-based care, at the core, it's, it really comes down to providers, physicians, care managers being proactive with the care that's being provided. We need to begin to anticipate what's occurring with patients. And, and frankly, not only is it will help us be successful in the contracts, it's the right thing to do for our patients. We're able to really respond to their needs. So it does come down to understanding what's occurring with the population and really risk stratifying the population. We typically put them into these three buckets, right? You have the high risk patients. It's typically anywhere between two to 5%. Um, coincidentally, that drives probably around maybe 60, 70, in some cases, 80% of the spend. But these are the patients that are really sick, right? We're not gonna reduce the amount of care. We wanna really focus on the efficiency of care that's being delivered. These are the patients that need it. However, the next category, the rising risk population, this is the one where as you're building your, your risk strategy or your value-based category, you really wanna focus on what's occurring with this population. So what are the different drivers um, around chronic diseases, age, different conditions, um, where are the patients going? If we can begin to think about that and be pr very proactive um, around what's occurring with those patients, the opportunity there to slow the cost curve or to, to let's say, reduce the cost curve a little bit, that's where the opportunity comes in. And then the third category is the low risk. And these are the ones that we wanna manage. We wanna make sure they're getting the care that they need. We wanna include them within our, our, our uh, chronic disease pathways or protocols. So we're managing and helping them to manage their diabetes properly and their high blood pressure and, and that sort of thing. But really understanding this population is critical. And Russell, it gets down to the risk methodology that we use. And one of the things that I've been particularly excited about is that the RAF score is really taking on more and more of the predominant methodology in measuring risk. And when you do that, the drivers of risk are re or the RAF score are really how we're capturing our HCCs as patients are starting to see the patients. And I'm sure you're seeing that as well too, as you're working with a lot of your, your clients and, and different healthcare providers. Yeah, this is an area that more and more organizations are realizing the importance of it. Um, you know, just even in, in treating patients and being able to segment their patients to make sure that they're providing, you know, the right access to care, an appropriate patient experience, and really helping, you know, the, this, this segment of the patients that really use, you know, 80, 90 percent of the healthcare services. So, you know, one, one of the, the big things that comes up, and, and this is where if an organization isn't able to calculate HCCs or, or risk scores internally, you know, the question oftentimes comes up and, and I'll, I'll be talking with, uh, you know, leadership and they'll say, well, this is, this is the medical director. This is a clinical issue. I'm like, well, treating the patients is a clinical issue, but getting paid is a financial issue. And so, you know, we, we need to be able to understand the population. As we'll talk about, a lot of people have this misconception that the payer is pulling data from your EHR when, in fact, they're pulling your claims data. So when we guide an organization and we say, well, how do you go about understanding what is the risk score of each patient and where is your, your high risk patients, et cetera, um, our approach is to start with that, that claims data, what you're actually billing out of the system, what you're capturing. And you know, to try to help understand the calculations that go into this, it's, it's easy to think about it in levels. Every visit potentially can create an encounter that could have 
an HCC on it based on the diagnosis codes. So the diagnosis codes are going to roll in and allow you to create what we call the encounter HCC. If you were to look at a patient and you were to break the diagnoses and map them to the HCCs, you might say this one patient had five visits this year, and of those five visits, three generated HCCs. But that doesn't get you to the risk score because then we have to roll up those HCCs into what we call the patient total HCCs. And for example, diabetes uh, has you know 17, 18, and 19. There's three different categories. And if we have one of each, the 17 is what you'd count. So there's a primary HCC that will throw out the secondary HCCs. So then you have to be able to understand all of the patient's HCCs to then roll that to say, these are all the HCCs a patient have. They might have two or four or six. And then ultimately that factors into how we're gonna calculate the risk score. And I think Dan, our next slide is gonna break down a little more of what the implications are of the risk score in those pieces. But ultimately when we think about structuring analytical data, we need to be able to step up through the data, ultimately roll it up to the practice, to the population, to the physician, to the payer. And then of course we wanna be able to to slice and dice or drill back through the data. And the reason for that is we need to understand when we're seeing performance gaps or seeing patients that are being missed, we need to be able to get all the way back down to the patient level of detail. So it's not enough just to summarize it. We really have to be able to work within the data at, at different levels. But let's break yeah. down the risk scores. I, I like that. I mean, not only do you then begin to measure it, but you begin to manage it with, within there. And I think if you go to the next slide, yeah. um, a lot of times I get asked, well, how do we then really influence the, the, the RAF score? You know, if we're using this for risk methodology, how do we begin to, to influence it? Well, this is a really a great summary that helps organizations think about how you could manage the population internally around the RAF score. And the HCC, as Russell said, it's absolutely critical to it. So a, a good rule of thumb is the RAF score, typically it's, it's you know, in and around a one point something or another. If CMS defines the RAF score of 1.0 to really reflect um, a senior, because this is basically how they've included this in Medicare Advantage, um, is, is generally healthy, right? So, you know, as, as we start to think about uh, managing patients, they have very limited Everybody has some issues around chronic diseases, but it's fairly limited in terms of where the challenges come in. If the patient has a RAF score above one, they typically have at least one chronic disease. And the more chronic diseases you have, the more that you're able to then <clears throat> go through some level of testing or follow up with different um, subspecialists or include different evaluations, you're capturing that in your HCCs and that's driving up your risk score. That's a good thing, right? We want to know that because that means that the cost associated with that more complex patient is justified. And I hear all the time when I talk to physicians, when they look at the quality data and we look at then their utilization, they often say, well, my utilization is higher, my costs are higher because my patients are sicker. And then I come back and I say, well, doctor, that might be true, but we need to prove that. This is where you can begin to prove it, but you only are able to show this if you're capturing your HCCs, critical to that. And even a slight increase in your RAF score can provide significant opportunities as you begin to look at the justification of cost, of proper utilization, right? There's good and bad utilization, as well as then understanding and being proactive with your patients as it aligns with some of your clinical protocols and paths. And so to sort of take this a step further, you know, if we think about the levels of data I was just showing at a very high level, here's an example where that analytics has been summarized up to the physician level, but you can see here, here's our patients and their RAF scores. And so if we want to identify, you know, what set of patients and where do those patients fall? And then we could even attribute potential revenue to them. So we could assign some sort of revenue, estimated revenue around this risk of patients. We could start to slice and dice through the data. This obviously is just exemplary. Um, but behind the analytics, of course, we would be able to slice and dice. We could drill in and we could do comparisons. And one of the biggest things that we like to do within the tools is if we know the risk scores this year, or a completed last year's score, which is really what you use as your benchmark, we often will go back a prior year. 
because you could have had patients that were missed in last year, but in the previous year had a higher level of diabetes and such. So we'd start to look at and, and flag out, and we'll talk about what we call the gaps, but the gaps really are where we're seeing patients that had a higher risk or in the past that haven't been coded or diagnosed or submitted. And then there's all these different reasons where getting those scores might be inaccurate. So we go back to being able to do comparisons and benchmark our own data, looking for those gaps and then slicing and dicing through data. And this is just a sort of a high level example of that, but it really comes back to having that data. So no matter how we're looking at it, whether it's across multiple years or across our HCC components or looking by physician or even looking by payer, we go back to having that right information so we can start to analyze through it. Okay, and well, let's and take this, Russell, and particularly the top HCC codes. Um, you know, sometimes it's tough for organizations to actually look at the data and to understand what some of the drivers are. But as you start to look at what those top codes are, it helps you then identify, well, you know, are there particular issues or conditions of a vast majority of the population that we should be looking at? Or if we believe, and we're starting to see some industry benchmarks in this regard, if we believe that, for instance, diabetes or endocrinology or, you know, cardiovascular disease and the cardiology group should have higher HCCs than we're seeing. Well, that allows you as a chief medical officer to go back to the teams and say, okay, what are we not doing here? How come our scores aren't, aren't higher than what they should be? So it does give you a good, a good opportunity to ask questions as well as then to begin to understand what's occurring. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I'm always a proponent on is scorecards. I believe that information needs to be provided to, um, to physicians, to leadership in a way that helps us understand what's occurring, but also allows us to interpret and understand what we need to change going forward. So this is an example of a scorecard that really looks at three of the key areas that are important in the value-based contract. One are the utilization measures. So it helps us understand where the patients are going. And typically you don't have to look at this across all of the disease categories. You look at the two or the three or the half dozen um, high profile, high important categories, and you give some consideration as to what's occurring with utilization. You do wanna look at your quality measures. Every value-based contract, has to have quality performance measures that are included in there. And frankly, you can do as, as well as, as you can in cost. If you don't hit the quality thresholds, you're not gonna achieve the outcomes or the scores. And then <clears throat> lastly are your costs, right? It does come down to cost because that's how you're saving in, saving in, your, in your dollars. So in the lower piece of this, um, we try to show a, a description or be able to show an example on how the RAF score can influence costs. So you can see for practice one, they have a much higher um, risk RAF score. Uh, there is a higher cost associated with it and they get a higher percentage of the overall shared savings, savings because again, their costs are justified as opposed to the example two, which frankly does have a higher expense, but has a lower RAF score and it's not justified. So again, really critical in making sure that we're capturing what's actually happening with the patients and then being able to report back in a way that physicians can understand it, the way the leadership can understand it, so we can really help to put ourselves in the best position as possible to do well on our contracts. So when we think about the keys to managing the population, Again, in my mind, it comes down to three things. One, we need to plan the outreach. We need to plan what's occurring with the patients and be proactive. And the only way you know where to start is by having good data and good information. And again, we've included annual wellness here. That is a significant driver um, towards our ability to capture the HCCs. Number two is optimizing the patient engagement. You need to make sure that we're capturing this in a way that is that's really driving um, the knowledge and insight as to what's happening with patients. And again, it helps us then identify the risk. And then third, at the end of the day, 
it is about performance. It is about managing costs. It is about you know still maximizing some of our revenues, and there are opportunities there. And I know Russell, this is an area that you know you spoke on for many for for quite a bit with many of your folks in terms of being able to manage the cost, but also drive a little extra revenue into the organization. Yeah, and we'll we'll talk about it in particular. You know, it's 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 interesting. I um, we did a webinar probably over ten years ago, and we had the the um, CEO was also the medical director and the physician. You know, was very clear. He said, "Doing the right things drives more revenue. We make more money." He said, "I'm not shy about that." He goes, "But we're also providing better care." So for anybody who says, well, it's all about, no, we're providing better care, right? So being able to manage those patients, understand the population, just, you know, very simple. Let's let's break it down a little further. This is just a summary of what I just showed, you know, maybe at a practice level, we'll talk about physician engagement and what a physician might need to see, but understanding what is the population of patients that fall into these HCCs? What is this population that we need to be focused on that's really gonna drive the revenue or impact our costs? And then understanding, are we treating those patients? How many patients have HCCs? How many HCCs do they have? What is their average risk score? And then, you know, have we been treating or seeing these patients and, and how do we go about focusing on this as a population? And it might start with a very simple, this is what we need to do at a summary level. Of course, we're gonna break down and talk about how do we support different areas of performance reporting? But you know, at the heart of it, it, it goes back to understanding our population and where we need to focus our services to be effective, you know, both right. clinically and financially. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, one of the questions for the audience, maybe you can include in the chat, it'd be interesting to hear how many of the attendees are actually focusing on an, an HCC uh, coordinated program where they're wrapping it around their AWVs and, and tying it to HCCs and then, of course, the RAF score. Um, you know, Russell, one organization I was working with not too long ago really didn't focus on this, yet they were bound and determined to negotiate their contracts around the RAF score, but they had no idea what they were asking for. And, and again, I think as, as we begin to really think about coming together, there, there is sort of this journey map, if you will, on how we can connect the dots with our annual wellness visits, capturing what we need to capture on the visit, tying that to HCCs and then our RAF score. So one of the things that I think become important uh, in supporting our performance reporting are really these elements that are on the screen. Making sure that we understand what the costs are and the drivers of that cost. We've talked about risk methodology, that becomes important. The other piece too is the attributed lives. What are we contracting around? Um, and making sure that we're contracting or being responsible for the lives that we can manage. Um, and this is an important point. We do a lot of managed care contracting on behalf of hospitals and health systems and medical groups across the country. And one of the first things that I often say is, you wanna be responsible for what we call the, the managed risk, the things we can control. If you're performing, you know, there is a high complicated tertiary need of certain segment of the population, such as advanced cancer support, and your organization doesn't provide it, you shouldn't contract it. But the only way that you begin to understand that is, is by managing what's occurring with the population. And then there's a few others there too, right? Managing the demographics, obviously the quality is key. Um, improving quality reduces cost. And then the other one that is near and dear to my heart is leveraging the domestic utilization and making sure that your provider, your physician integrated network is utilizing the the, the resources that are within the network, your referrals are supporting that, all of those areas. Um, Russell, any any particular element here, maybe a couple of them, any of those, any of these stand out to you? Uh, you know, uh, to me, always quality and utilization. You know, I, I think utilization drives cost. Um, and if you don't understand that as it applies to your, your population and the risk, you, you're probably, you may be not appropriately allocating. Um, you know, your resources. 
um, we're we're seeing more and more. You know, you you mentioned um, you know wellness visits and and organizations usage. We're we're starting to see organizations more focused on that. I think from a at least from my side when I you know usually hearing about it from an analytics side. We've been talking about it for years, um, and I think COVID pause that quite a bit because it's hard to bring people in for wellness visits when you can't even bring people into the office without risk to the elderly and the and the population. But it seems like that's an area that we're seeing more and more people starting to focus on. Um, yeah. But to me, you know, qu yeah, quality and utilization, are, you know, the, those are the two big areas focused on, you know, the, those are the areas we tend to see the most. Yeah. And, you know, and the workforce implications are also are affecting our ability to do annual wellness. And what I would certainly suggest to, to folks that are participating in the webinar today, if you have an issue with, with maybe not enough schedule time with your physicians, you know, you, this is a great opportunity to incorporate telehealth or virtual health as a way of being able to connect to it. There's a revenue opportunity there, but the bigger opportunity is being able to capture that information. So there are, there are sort of non-standard ways of expanding the clinical delivery model beyond the traditional approach, all of which will influence your ability to manage the utilization, obtain the right level of information, and then really impact quality. Yeah, you know, it, it, interesting little side note, my my 87 year old mother called me and she said, the insurance company wants to send a doctor out to my house to do a wellness visit. And I thought, boy, that's interesting, right? So if the if the health system isn't doing them, the insurance companies are going to go and try to do them themselves directly, right? Understanding the importance of trying to manage cost, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And I think that's I think that's great. So you know, what I often say to organizations is you have to have a very focused approach on how you want to manage risk within your population. You can't do it the same way for everybody. You wanna make sure that you're really given some consideration to the needs of those that are considered in the high risk cohort, maybe have more, need more complex care, maybe just some uh, chronic disease management versus those are prevention. So it ties into the risk pyramid, if you will, but really understanding what's occurring with that population becomes key because then we can really be very focused and direct care based on the needs of that cohort of the population and as you think about that and being being very focused on on that and being very directed in terms of that you can really start to see some of the outcomes that are occurring yeah, and so you know, one of the key areas you mentioned, it, you know, meeting with physicians. Um, one of the areas that we you know talk to quite a bit and and understanding. So we go back to who who are those high risk patients, who are the patients that have HCCs, and if you're not familiar, every year the the risk score resets uh, on your HCC population, right? So each year you've got to do the same work. It's not enough that you scored them last year if you didn't score them or treat them this year. So, you know, being able to engage physicians to understand what is your role in this, right? Which patients are you the, the you know, the PCP and where are you in terms of hitting goals? And so, you know, whether it's it's analytics web-based or it's a, it's, a, it's a report that delivers through an email, but making sure that each physician understands their role, which is, you know, you have 27 patients that we still need to score and making sure that their care teams are aligning and working and supporting the physician to get the patients in. They know and understand what are the HCCs. You know, I, I hear that occasionally, you know, uh, I can't tell in the EMR, you know, sitting in front of my doctor and she said, I can't tell, I can't look back at some of your diagnoses. Did you, did we do this or do we have this? And I thought, oh boy, I don't, you know, I don't wanna hear that. But making sure the physicians have the information, they understand who those patients are, that care teams understand making it easy to get patients in. So, you know, on the front end, it's making sure that you have clear goals to what you're trying to accomplish. And of course, you, just what you said, you know, stratifying that population and being able to focus in on that. Um, and then, you know, Dan, as you and I were preparing, we talked a little bit about, what about physician compensation as you shift from fee-for-service to you know value-based care and so i you know i brought in just a, a sample dashboard and we we adjusted this just a little bit for today's webinar but you know talking about organizations shifting from more you know traditional 
you know, revenue, shared revenue based on, you know, collections um, to maybe something like a work RVU model, but, you know, really critical that you have an appropriate percentage within your comp that is focused on HCC scoring, quality metrics, shared savings pools, you know, that's appropriate to where you are in the value-based, you know, um, care contracting and, and how you're now collecting. Because if you're still running sort of an older model, um, you know, your, your incentive, your, your physician comp may not be in alignment. And of course, we could probably spend a whole webinar just talking about comp, uh, you know, in particular, but yeah, really and, important. And I'll tell you, this is just to reiterate, that's such an important point. I can't tell you how many organizations are still on the traditional RVU model where 90 or 95 percent of the compensation is based on the RVU, but organizations now are starting to move into value-based care and they may have 10 to 20 percent of their revenue that are value-based. Well, you don't have aligned incentives, right? The higher utilization drivers of fee in a fee-for-service world and capturing RBUs does not align with the outcomes that are required to manage the population in the value-based care world. So maybe that is a future conversation for us to, to talk through, but boy, this, that's an area that, that as, a, as a healthcare leader who's managing um, an integrated provider community, that's something that really does have to be aligned. Yeah, and just, you know, going back to when you think about steps as you move into, you know, value-based contracting, you probably need to be planning about moving your compensation because that's not something you can change overnight, right? So right. being able to tell physicians, you know, even here is the current plan and here's what we're, you're going to be measured on so they can start managing their own performance to the future goals without it impacting them because maybe they're not adjusted, the care teams are still getting in alignment and they're trying to understand exactly how they fit into this sort of changed uh, world here. So, you know, definitely something that has to be planned and thought about. Um, so with that, let's let's touch on the third area, which is m measuring performance and outcomes. And let's talk about that because we're also uh, sort of running out of time here, but. Uh, yeah, I think when you, when you think about measuring performance, um, Obviously, you have to have the data, you have to have the analytics, but in, in my mind, that's really not enough, right? I often say, you know, good data provides good information, but good information provides knowledge. And you have to, it allows you an opportunity to not only understand what's occurring, but why it's occurring, and then to be deliberate in terms of impacting some of the operational changes or the population and making, you know, making some real improvements. One area is an example that's near and dear to my heart is managing the leakage and managing where patients are going. And whether you're in a large metropolitan area or you're even in a rural area, everybody manages or should be concerned with where your patients are going. So you do want to begin to think about understanding your, your patient activity around geography, what specialties they're seeing, um, how do we bring them back to the attributed PCP because obviously within value-based care, that alignment between the patient and the PCP is critical, but also making sure that they're, that they're being referred to the right specialist. And it's, again, it's performance-based, it's outcome-based. There's a good collaboration and efficiency that involved, as well as then understanding what the service type is. These are all the categories that really become important when we focus on linkage. When we think about what are the considerations or the drivers of, of leakage, it really comes down to these categories, right? Where are your patients going? So when you focus on, for instance, the Medicare Advantage population, many folks are retired, right? And, you know, in some cases, I saw a study with one provider-sponsored health plan that had a Medicare Advantage product, 30, over 30 to 35 percent of their population traveled somewhere south, right? This was a group that was in Wisconsin traveled somewhere south over the course of their performance year. We have to understand that. And again, you know, getting that, that not just pulling the data from the HR, but the claims data becomes important and being able to understand it. And then other things like um, visits that are avoidable, which, is our, which are unavoidable, the behaviors of the physician, great way to provide some feedback tool, um, and then things around access. Access is probably the biggest one that I think really allows you to kind of manage leakage. And, you know, Russell, what are some of the, the data considerations or some of the drivers that you look at as you start to measure leakage? 
Well, I mean, you, we go back to utilization. We go back to being able to track. In some organizations, you know, there's a there's a challenge with the systems where it's oftentimes hard to measure if if patients are going out of network or out of system, um, because you know referrals coming in is often tracked and available, but it's not the data on the other side is not available. Um, you know, and and right right or wrong here in the presentation, you know, I I would. I wanted to spend a minute and talk about, you know, having the right data, whether it's leakage data, understanding your population, understanding your costs. But, you know, many organizations, they, they think, well, if we can, if we can give a, a picture, you know, or it's a static report, you know, if we can give the end user some piece of information, but it's a, it's a PDF or it's, it's stuck, they can't, they can't see beyond the data. And so they're either going to have to go back and ask, um, you know, and so we talk about data driven and most organizations, I think everybody understands the value of analytics yet at times we still lag because, you know, to me, having a picture or a PDF or something that they put into Tableau, but it's not interactive because the organization doesn't have a unified strategy. You really need just not what's, what is our leakage or what's coming back from the insurance company or we might need to blend data. But, you know, can we can we visualize it? Can we slice and dice through it? And can we drill down on it? Right. And so in, in thinking about your analytics strategy, you know, is an interesting time when you think about what well, we're going to contract for value based care. But do we even have the right analytics in our organization that supports the kind of detailed patient level reporting we need? to understand HCCs and performance gaps at the patient level, being able to summarize it and sort of put it all together where then the, those users who need to be able to slice and dice through and find the gaps have the right tools, right? And so here at PDS, you know, thinking about having a unified analytics tool that makes the end users easier to get at the information can be the difference between sort of, I ran one report and then I go look in the system and I run another report and then I go over here to another tool and I'm not having the data sort of in concert you know, working together. So, you know, it's it's the difference between looking at, say, a picture, you know, here we're used to publishing a, a panels, you know, physician panels. We're used to sort of segregating patients and saying, this is your panel, right? That may not be enough to support the kind of reporting that you're going to need as you shift to value-based care, um, you know, so. Yeah, and, and yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I think one of the, yeah. the biggest the biggest outcomes or opportunities that I see is if information is delivered in a way that it can be interpreted well by physicians, that they understand how to incorporate it within their own practice, boy, that in and of itself is very powerful, right? I mean, it's very powerful. And so then when you, when you look at where these elements are and, and how we're able to really drive some of these uh, outcomes, you know, delivering that information in, in such a way that they can create that impact, that's where you're really going to be able to see some or gain some real traction. Um, focusing on utilization, though, oftentimes I get asked, well, you know, how do we manage our utilization? In some cases, utilization is there's good utilization, there's bad utilization. How do we focus on, on making sure that, you know, we're not just reducing utilization to, to reduce costs? You want to focus on what's going to drive the greatest potential outcome for your patients, but as well as then the contract. And in some cases, a patient going to the emergency department, if they have a very serious complex issue is the right thing to do. In other cases, it could be handled through virtual health. It could be handled through an urgent care setting. There are other alternatives. And again, being able to think about what those alternatives are and some of the cost drivers really become key. And I know oftentimes when we focus on utilization, um, there are drivers that are within the contract that really help support good utilization versus bad utilization. And focusing on, on what some of those outputs are become really important. Yeah, so, you know, one of the key areas certainly um, that we've talked about, we touched on this, is leveraging the, the annual wellness visit as, as a way, one, to ensure that we're, we're treating all of the HCCs or at least coding appropriately to, to check the box. Did we, did we treat the patient for the, the HCCs, which in and of itself um, will help drive, you know, your performance against the contract? Um, but the, the second area is, you know, and this becomes a quality issue as well as we talked about. So being able to understand, again, good analytics, 
who is the population? Where do they sit? Are they past due for their wellness visits? Do, are we expecting to see them? Do, you know, we, we don't have to worry about the patients that are scheduled to come in because we know we're going to be treating them. What about all the patients that have no appointment? And being able to very quickly sort of get down to, this is what we're talking about, having those analytics that aren't just, hey, we have you know, 200 patients that we haven't treated and we have three months left. No. Where do we see gaps in our performance? And can we very quickly start to attribute which physicians might need additional areas or which contracts that's impacting. So being able to very quickly sort of identify with our analytics and understand, and the, the annual wellness visit, I would say is probably one of the best places to focus in on utilization, right? That is sort of low cost with a high impact on the, on the quality and, and the, the performance of the agreement. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. By capturing the HCCs, you start to identify what's good utilization versus bad utilization, what a utilization um, should be avoided down the road. And it helps you kind of think about alternative deliveries of care, alternative models and so forth. It, it's quite powerful when you think about that level of information that can come out of the HCCs. Yeah. And then we touched on this briefly, but, you know, we're still seeing that the utilization of the annual wellness visit, you know, the, the last estimate I saw was a few years old, but I, I would say it's still well below probably what, 35, 40%. I don't think organizations are seeing. So, you know, being able to do sort of performance reporting where you could attribute revenue and estimate revenue and say, you know, these are the physicians in our organization that are using wellness visits. And you can see even our best physician is only up at 40%. But if we were to say, let's just look at these physicians that are well below just our practice average, let alone that we maybe we should be doing 80%. Right. And we could start to very quickly attribute, you know, there's estimated revenue here just in the increased revenue of, say, coding a wellness visit versus coding, you know, a regular E&M office visit. Right. And those opportunities. So being able to do some kind of financial performance reporting to understand where there are gaps and potential improvement can oftentimes help drive. You know, we go back to it's a quality issue, but it's also a financial issue. And this has doesn't even go into the implications if you're a, you know, on a value based contract where it's going to impact your risk scores. So just an example of that. So one of the things, Russell, that I, I'm a firm believer that you need to really take into consideration the whole process, the whole structure, not necessarily manage it in, in a silo. So, you know, what we've talked about is the contract. We talked about managing the population. We talked about delivering great insights to, to providers, but we also have to make sure that we're capturing the right level of information and our revenue cycle is the, for, is the best way of being able to do that. So the two outside silos, if you will, or pillars, Focus on your traditional revenue cycle activities that are important on driving collections. But the middle functions, I think, are, are oftentimes underrepresented when we think about the revenue cycle activities, how we're capturing and our, our coding and our documentation, you know, denial management, both in terms of the provider side and the payer side, absolutely influences your ability to reconcile. You know, I'll share a, a, a quick story with you. For one of my clients, um, they captured and at the end of the performance year, did their own calculation and thought they were able to save quite a bit of money because of, of the, the patients that they were seeing in some of the performance activity. Well, they were, it was quite a bit different from what the payer had. And the big difference was that the, the organization, provider organization had upwards of 15% denial rate. Well, those denied claims were not in the payer's um reporting because they were denied claims right they weren't they weren't included so again those things really become important as we think about how we're really going to, to manage the patients but really also i think the ehr and the data that we get that really does drive a lot of the quality activity and really the outreach with the patients yeah, you know, I, I mentioned this and this kind of illustrates just, just what you said. You know, the EHR data is not what's driving the risk scores, right? So the insurance companies don't have access to the EHR. You you do internally to manage the patient's care. But when you think about it and and your your example with denials, this is a this is a key area, right? So what goes through the EHR has to go over to coding. 
Then it gets sent through the billing system. We could have internal edits that might be flagging. Um, oftentimes, then it goes through a clearinghouse. We've seen instances, we're working with a client currently where we're trying to analyze where the clearinghouse is not sending all of the diagnoses over when we have more than 12 diagnoses. So we're trying to do some analysis now to see if that has any impact on the actual risk scores. You'd, you'd hope it didn't. Um, but, the, you know, there are examples of that. And then, of course, your denial rate. If the claim is denied, it never gets sent over and doesn't become part of the risk score. So, you know, ultimately understanding your denial rates, and this is actually true for fee-for-service as well. If you're negotiating a contract and you've got a very high denial rate, you're not collecting what you think you've contracted for because you're not getting paid on it. So denials has a has a real big impact. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's about understanding what you know your performance was with your data. So when the insurance company comes back and says, well, here's what we think you did, or here's what we are calculating, and there's so many different instances where they can get data wrong, um, you know, ultimately, can we understand and be able to prove to them that we know where the gaps are, we've got data to support it, and ultimately, we need to get paid on the things we did, not on how you calculated or what you think we did when we have facts and data to back it up. So. So one thing that we do to help organizations, particularly CFOs, is we create what we call a value model. And it's a way of being able to assess the implications of a contract and then also allow you then to incorporate a lot of operational output. And it comes down to three areas. What's the ROI and the calculator around a value-based contract? What does it mean to an organization that is different from a fee-for-service contract? How do we manage utilization knowing that there's going to be a transition from acute to ambulatory, and then the predictive model, modeler. If we were to do this, that, and the other, what would the implications mean to the acute setting, the ambulatory setting, cost, revenue, and so forth? So this level of a value model becomes really important and quite valuable to a CFO. And, um, you know, from, from my end, obviously, PDS is an analytics company, but, you know, as we talk about value-based care, making that transition, right, it's all about having good data, both having the right tools so as you have the data, you can disseminate it quickly and easily, ensuring the right people have the right information to understand their role, and as you tune performance, the analytics can't be static, right? So it's being able to adjust the dashboards, the reports, the visualizations, so the users understand and we can get to the goal, right? Being able to target key performance opportunities, understand our leakage, our denial rates, where there are these different levers that we can control, and you know, and making it easy for leadership and even you know care teams, the end users, to be able to understand their role, whether it's the physician understanding what's expected, or it's the care teams, or that front scheduler making sure that we get the right patients in to appropriately manage our contracts. So it really is, you know, having good data um, is is key to being successful with these contracts. So with that, I think we'll we'll conclude the webinar because we're just coming up on the hour. Dan, thank you so much for doing this with us here. Uh, great information and uh, always a pleasure to work with you. And um, to all of you attended, thank you for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day and, and good luck as you're as you're thinking about value-based contracting. Thank you.